Hello, my name is Nathan Kelleher, and today I will be presenting my capstone project about Raven's crypto system that was advised by Dr. Bindner. So today I will walk through an introduction of Raven's crypto system. I will talk about what it is and uh, how itself and other crypto systems are used in today's society. Uh, I will then walk through the setup for Raven's crypto system, talk about the encryption and decryption process and everything that goes into those. I will walk us through an example that is outlined in my paper. And I will also walk through the verification of the plain text messages. So to start, Raven's crypto system is an asymmetric crypto system. It, an asymmetric crypto system just you, makes use of private and public keys. So these private and public keys are used to encrypt and decrypt information to keep them private from uh, third party sources so that they don't know what's being sent. So Raven's crypto system throughout the decryption process, it makes use of the Euclidean algorithm it looks at linear Diophantine equations and it uses Euler's criterion to verify that a plain text message is a potential cipher text message. So asymmetric cryptography is used throughout online commerce. They're seen in transport layer security, which is whenever you search for a website or anything else that requires your private information such as credit card number, debit card number, home address, anything like that. It'll encrypt it and then it'll be sent over the internet so that when it's pinged between different servers, those servers won't be able to uh, obtain your information. It'll be kept private until it gets to the server that you're searching for and sending your information to which it then will be decrypted and processed. So let's talk about the setup for Raven's system. So in order to do this, we'll use two people. We'll name them Bob and Alice. And uh, let's just say Bob wants to send a message to his wife, Alice. So he'll send the message encrypted with the public key, which will be seen by anyone. And then Alice, will use the private key, which she'll only have to decrypt the message. So here's a visual for this. So Bob wants to send hello to Alice, but he doesn't want a third party sources to see it. So it's encrypted with the public key, which um, anybody knows. So it's encrypted with Alice's public key and then Alice will decrypt it with the private key, which only she'll know. So she'll obtain the encrypted message and be able to decrypt it with the private key and see that Bob sent her hello. So in order to do this, Bob needs to find the public and private key. So in order to do this, he'll pick two large prime numbers, P and Q, such that P is congruent to 3 mod 4 and Q is congruent to 3 mod 4. Using those two prime numbers, he'll compute N, which is just P times Q. From this, we'll see that the public key is N, which is equal to PQ, and the private key will be the order pair PQ, which Alice will have, and only she'll know what that is. Everybody else will know what the value of N is. So an encryption process is just the encoding of information that keeps it private. It will call it the plain text message before it's encrypted. So when it is encrypted, we'll call it the cipher text. So encoding a message just makes it harder for a third party to gather the information between two parties. So we can take a message M and first convert it to a number 
lowercase m that's less than n, which is our public key. And then we can find a value for c satisfying c congruent to lowercase m squared mod n. And c will be our ciphertext. The decryption process is taking the ciphertext c and using it to find the plain text by using the private key that is established by the sender. The private key will, in this case, is known by Alice. So she'll use that to decrypt C to find the plain text message, lowercase m. So at the start of the decryption process, Alice will only know the two prime values for P and Q. And those are used to find lowercase m, which are plain text message. So Alice obtains P and Q from Bob, which is the private key. She wants to start by finding the values for R and S that satisfy these two equations. R congruent through C to the 1 fourth times P plus 1 mod P. And S congruent to C to the fourth times Q plus one mod Q. The next step is to use the private key to find the values for X and Y that satisfy the linear Diophantine equation, X times P plus Q times Y, which equals one. Lastly, after finding the values for X, R, Y, and S, she'll solve for the values for mi such that m1 is congruent to xps plus yqr mod n, m2 is congruent to n minus m1, m3 is congruent to xps minus yqr mod n, and m4 is congruent to n minus m3. Only one of these plain text messages will be the actual plain text message that was encrypted. So Alice won't be able to determine which plain text message is the correct one without further information. Further information would be something such as a digital signature that Bob establishes while sending Alice the ciphertext message. So moving on to an example. Let's say Bob selects two prime numbers, P and Q. Let, he'll let P equal 19 and Q equal 31. Both of these are congruent to three mod four. Now, we'll suppose that Bob wants to encrypt the capital or Y. So referring to the ASCII table, the letter Y has the value of 89. The ASCII table is a table that assigns a value, a numeric value to symbols and lowercase and uppercase letters. So that's where 89 comes from. On the ASCII table, capital Y is equivalent to 89. So we'll let lowercase m be equal to 89. So the public key will be n equal to p times q, which is 19 times 13 which is equivalent to 589. The private key that would be used by Alice to decrypt the encrypted message will be the order pair 19 and 31. So she'll only know what 19 and 31 are. In order to encrypt M, Bob needs to solve for the value C, such that C is congruent to M squared mod N. Also, M is less than N, so that's another hypothesis that um, is verified and makes this system work. So C is congruent to 89 squared mod 589, which is equivalent to 264 mod 589. So the ciphertext will then be C equal to 264. Alice can now decrypt the ciphertext with the private key 19 and 31. The ciphertext, as a reminder, is C, which is 289. So she starts by solving for R and S such that 
R is congruent to C to the fourth times P plus one mod P. And that is equivalent to six mod 19 after plugging in the values for C and P. And correction, C is equivalent to 264. So moving on, S will be equivalent to C to the fourth times Q plus one mod Q. Plugging in the values for C and Q, we see that S is congruent to four mod 31. The next step for Alice is to find the values of X and Y. And she'll do that by solving the linear Diophantine equation using the Euclidean algorithm. We're gonna skip the part of using the Euclidean algorithm as it's outlined in the paper and it's just the longer tedious process. So X is found to be negative 13 and Y is eight. So now that we've found the values for X, Y, R, and S, we're able to find the four potential plain text candidates. So from this, we see that M1 is going to be congruent to X times P times S plus Y times Q times R mod N. Plugging in the values that we found, we find that M1 is congruent to 500 mod 589. For M2, we see that it's congruent to 589 minus 500, which is equivalent to 89. M3 is then equivalent to 469 mod 589. And M4 is then congruent to N minus M3, which is congruent to 589 minus 469, which is 120. So Alice receives those four solutions for her plain text. She gets M1 to be 500, M2 to be 89, M3 is 469, and M4 is 120. And this is the difficulty of Raven's crypto system. It's for every character that we encrypt or every word that we encrypt that's assigned a numeric value, we'll get four potential solutions. So in this example, we know that M2 is 89 because we're on the outside looking into this scenario. We saw that Bob encrypted the capital letter Y, which is equivalent to 89 on the ASCII table. So Alice would not be able to tell which is the correct solution without further information. So in order to even know that these are possible solutions, we should be able to verify that these can be potential plain text solutions. So that's our next step is to verify M1, M2, M3, and M4 are actually plain text solutions. So we'll first start by looking at the values of R squared and S squared. So R squared is congruent to C times C to the half P minus one mod P, which is congruent to C mod P. So we know that C to the half P minus one is congruent to one by Euler's criterion. And similarly, we can show that S squared is congruent to C mod Q. And we can rewrite both of these as R squared equal to C plus P times K for some K in the integers or for some k in the natural numbers, and s squared equal to c plus q times j for some j in the natural numbers. Using those solutions for s squared and r squared, we can solve, or we'll start by looking for m1 squared. So squaring m1, which was x, times P times S plus Y times Q times R in mod N. We see that squaring it gives us X squared times P squared times S squared plus two times X Y times P Q times R S plus Y squared Q squared R squared mod N. And since we're working in mod N, 
and n is equivalent to p times q, we know that p times q will be zero in mod n. So this middle term, we can cancel out and it'll just be zero. So we're stuck with x squared times p squared times s squared plus y squared times q squared times r squared in mod n. So recall that we saw that r squared is equal to c plus p times k and s squared is equal to c plus q times j. Substituting those in for s squared and r squared, we see that x squared times p squared will then be um, x squared plus, or x squared times p squared times c plus x squared times p squared times q and j, and so forth. So we observe that x squared times p squared times q times j is equal to zero mod n, and similar for y squared p squared q times k. So we now have two non-zero, or we have two terms that contain a c. So factoring those out, we get that c times uh, x squared times p squared plus c times y squared times q squared in mod n is congruent to c times x squared times p squared plus y squared times q squared mod n. So we need to examine what x squared p squared plus y squared q squared is. So we'll consider x times p plus y times q squared. And this is equivalent to x squared times p squared plus 2x pyq plus y squared q squared. The middle term, we know it'll be zero because it contains a q and a p. And thus, we can rewrite it as x squared p squared plus y squared q squared, which is equal to x times p plus y times q squared. And earlier, we looked at the linear Diophantine equation, px plus qy, which is equal to one. So substituting this in for uh, one, we see that m1 squared will be congruent to c times one squared in mod n. So m1 squared is then congruent to the ciphertext c in mod n. So m1 squared is a potential ciphertext candidate. So M1 is a potential plain text candidate. Our next step is to verify the message M2. So we start by taking M2 squared. We see that it's congruent to N minus M1 squared, which is N squared minus two times N times M1 plus M1 squared. We just verified that M1 squared is congruent to C in mod N and N is congruent to zero, so the middle term will be zero. So we see that m2 squared is congruent to zero plus c mod n, which is just congruent to c mod n. So we see that m2 squared is a potential candidate. And similarly, we can show that m3 and m4 will be potential plain text candidates. We won't show them here because they're very similar to showing that M1 and M2 are potential plain text candidates. So in conclusion, yeah, so here I just show that M3 and M4 are also plain text candidates. So here are my re references. And in conclusion, I just want to take time to thank Professor Ryan and my classmates for editing my paper throughout the semester and taking time out of the day to help me out. And I wanna thank Dr. Bidner for being my advisor and helping me on the journey of writing the paper and putting together slides for this presentation. So thank you. And that's all I have for you.